Let's go ahead and hop in. Uh, so my topic this afternoon is errors, business cycles, and government stimulus. Uh, so before I get too far, I, I want to say like th this topic, I'm going to give a little bit of background of kind of how I started looking into this, as I really think this topic, um, specifically the first part about errors and business cycles, is probably the first topic that I did any work on where I made a however very, very small, but possibly p a positive contribution right, to the literature. So <laughs> my first non-negative um, contribution. So anyway, uh, so I'm really interested in this idea of errors, but, but how did this come about? Well, it started because uh, I became very convinced of Austrian business cycle theory and that it is in fact true and descriptive of what happens in the economy. Of course, not everybody agrees with us, right? And there are critics out there that try to criticize the theory along various lines. Right, so uh, for example, uh, Paul Krugman right, likes to criticize our theory. And it's very frustrating to read Paul Krugman criticizing the Austrian theory, as it's obvious that he has not read much about it or even bothered to look at Professor Garrison's PowerPoints. So, so like five minutes of those PowerPoints and most of his objections are gone, right? Because he clearly doesn't actually understand the theory. Uh, the one that stands out to me is he makes this claim that all oh, the Austrian business cycle theory suggests that we should have this negative correlation between consumption and investment. That's one of his favorite lines to pull out. But, but of course, it, like, you look at Professor Garrison's PowerPoints, the only time you'd see a negative correlation between consumption and investment is if our time preferences have changed, right? So we're moving along the production possibility frontier toward either a faster or slower long run rate of growth, right? Of course, once the growth happens, now both consumption and investment are growing together at some rate, or say a business cycle is starting, then we're moving outside of that right, stable, sustainable production possibility frontier with both consumption and investment growing. And then when things turn, they both fall. Right? So, so what Paul Krugman says is just flatly not true, which makes it remarkably difficult to respond to. It's, just want to say, look at the PowerPoints. <laughs> Anyway, uh, or uh, for example, there's also um, Friedman's plucking model, right? right so Friedman, as he um, kind of moved on in life, thinking about the issue of business cycles, he became convinced right, that business cycles are not a boom and bust, but rather a bust and recovery. Right? So, and this obviously would move against the Austrian theory where the bust is the result of the boom rather than the other way around. Well, here, right, Friedman isn't really understanding what's actually happening. He's thinking on too aggregate of a level, right? So it might be that during the boom, we don't see this unusual, extremely high rate of overall economic growth. Right? We, we still do have actual physical limits to how much we can grow, right? But we still have this misallocation of capital, right? We're moving out of right, those middle stages, right? Being stretched in both directions toward higher consumption and also higher long-run investment, right? So we might not see this enormous growth, uh, in terms of things like GDP, nonetheless, we get this misallocation, which will result in the collapse eventually. Right? So it, it, he's overly aggregating and missing the actual story. But the best criticism that I've found right, for the Austrian business cycle theory that I thought was actually worth more of a response is the rational expectations view. Right? Now here we have, now the first benefit is the people that author these types of um, criticisms tend to be more familiar right, with the Austrian business cycle theory. Uh, for example, there is um, one person, a fairly well-known economist, his name is Ludwig von Mises, and he authored this um, book, right, Theory of Money and Credit, uh, in which he suggests right, that if people could actually come to expect what the effects would be of this monetary uh, injection, then they would act in such a way as to offset the grand majority of the effects. Okay, that suggests that maybe this is a pretty good criticism, right? possibly. Right? Uh, other people like Brian Kaplan also like to bring out this kind of thing. Now, and we could very easily respond by saying, well, maybe expectations just aren't rational. Problem solved, right? Okay, <laughs> there we go. It's just an unrealistic assumption that you're throwing on here. Uh, but then Kaplan is very clever, right? And he says, but, right, right, Austrians believe, right, that entrepreneurs are generally pretty good at what they do. And by our perspective, what right, entrepreneurs do right, is foresee what demand is going to be for a good and plan ahead of time for that demand so that we can actually produce the good on time for when people need it. Right? Right, so the idea of having good foresight is actually built into our view of how entrepreneurs work as they're using their judgment. They're, they're good at foresight in order to use their judgment well. If this is true, right, then that suggests that maybe Entrepreneurs actually could possibly foresee what's going to happen. Hmm. 
And if entrepreneurs are driving the production process, now we have a problem we actually have to deal with. Right? It's not so easy as just saying expectations aren't rational. Because in some places, while we may not say that strictly, we come very close right, to saying this. Okay. Well, the first thing I want to point out as we're responding um, to this criticism is this idea that error, right, that is making plans that don't actually work out, having expectations that don't actually get fulfilled in the future, this is not at all unique to the Austrian theory of the business cycle. In fact, virtually every uh, business cycle theory is built on this idea that there are errors being made uh, by entrepreneurs as they're looking toward the future. Even uh, somebody like, say, John Maynard Keynes, right? When you start looking into the way equilibrium works in his system, right, when things start moving, it's because our inventories are different than what our planned inventories were. Right? This suggests there was an error in entrepreneurs' minds. Right? We, we had some idea of what we, wanted what we wanted inventories to be. They didn't end up there because we overestimated or underestimated what consumption was going to be. And now we have to adjust production in order to get inventories where we would like them to be. Right? We're, we're adjusting to the error we made. Right. Or uh, we also have, say, just kind of a, a standard, here. this might be some kind of heresy to draw this graph here, but we'll do it. Oh. Can't forget that, A. Eh? Or if we look at the standard aggregate supply, aggregate demand, the way that it is currently taught, we have this nice long-run aggregate supply curve in there. And suppose that something happens, so there's an increase in aggregate demand for some reason. I'll just call it a shock. There we go. That, that's the reason that it increased. There was a shock. Right? Maybe people were more confident for no reason. Okay. Right, so we have this increase in aggregate demand. Right? Oh, there we go. Now we get this boom, right? Price levels start going up. At the same time, we get a boom in the economy and real GDP. Right? Of course, then we know the story is right, that once people realize right, prices have gone up, right, we start asking for higher levels of wages. Right? Well, now the costs of production are increasing, right? As a result, suppliers find it not worth, actually worthwhile to produce anymore as their costs have gone up, right? so they fall back right toward that long-run aggregate supply point. Okay. Now, the observation of the new classicals was that if people have good foresight about what prices are going to do, right, then as aggregate demand is increasing, right, moving to the right, aggregate supply will simultaneously right, shift to the left. So we don't actually get a boom in the economy whatsoever. Right? Right, so there must be something else going on, right? There's an error, right? The only reason we got this was that somehow prices rose without us realizing it and thinking to ask for higher wages along the way. Okay. Uh, now I would note uh, here, kind of the modern, I guess, you might say inheritors of this view would be the real business cycle theorists, right? And the real business cycle theorists is probably one of the most ironically named uh, theories out there. And I will admit I have certain sympathies for it, but, because I had a couple people that really advocate this view on my dissertation committee, and, and they let me pass. <laughs> right? It's one of the most ironically named, because what they really are claiming right, is that business cycles aren't really real. Right? Like, rather, there are these real changes that happen in the economy, and it's not necessarily cyclical. Right? Just kind of we in our own minds, we like to see patterns. Right? So, oh, we had some kind of positive technology shocks, now we're producing more. And then there's some kind of negative technology shock, and now we're producing less. And we interpret this right, as being a boom followed by a bust and so on. Now, sometimes they do use things like the way that capital adjusts to these to get something more cyclical out of it. Right? But still, when you look at what is happening here, what was it that started that? This positive technology shock and this negative technology shock. Well, this is an error, right? This, we had this shock come along that people did not foresee. Right? There's this assumption, right? These shocks have some kind of distribution. The distribution centers around zero or one, right, depending on how you want to formulate this thing. And we expect right, things to be average, because on average, things are average. Of course, we never actually experience in any particular day the average day. Right? So we're shocked every time. Oh, wow. Things weren't actually average today. This is amazing. Right? You know, I know that the average height for people is 5'10", so for, uh, for males in America. But it's amazing how few people I meet that are actually 5'10". It's, it's, so weird, right? It's okay, so we're shocked all the time right, in these models, and it's these shocks that are resulting in what we at least interpret as business cycles. Okay, right, so error being a part of business cycle theory is not unique to us, right? 
but let's look a little bit more deeply into exactly how does error play out, what is kind of the Austrian view of how errors play into explaining the business cycle, and then we'll get into what implication does this have for things like if we want to stimulate the economy in the course of a recession. And so uh, here when I look at the roles of the role of errors in, biz, in um, our business cycle theory, uh, I do want to recommend a paper that I'm going to disagree with on some points, or rather going to ignore on some points. Uh, that's Guido Holzman's general theory of error cycles. Right? Uh, in this uh, paper, uh, I read it, when I read it, I was very, very impressed, right? And then I went on and did my research totally ignoring <laughs> what Dr. Holzman said. Right? Uh, Holzman suggests right, that we can break kind of the way that error is treated in Austrian um, approaches into kind of two different ways, right? One is what he calls the consequentialist theory of error, right? Where we see that there are conditions that lead to error. So error is a consequence of things. And then there is Holtzman's theory, which I don't know that he would claim it existed before him, right? Is the essentialist view of error, which is that if we really believe that economics should be based on an analysis of human action, well, we never plan for error, right? So error is never a part of the end we are shooting at. Gee, I really want to make an error is kind of his claim. It rather is just something we have to accept as a given, right? So it's just something that will show up occasionally. So we should just take as given that errors will happen. And then what we can do as economists is, for example, we can analyze institutions, right? To see if they may be inherently erroneous. That is that they will not possibly achieve the ends that they um, are shooting for, and he lays out a few different institutions that would apply to right, things like fiat money, things like fractional reserve banking, right, and so on. Okay. Right, so he can kind of suggest we shouldn't go down this consequentialist path. Right? So I'm going to go down this consequentialist path. Okay. All right. right. So in Austrian business cycle theory, right, business cycles are really driven right, by this cluster of errors. Right? We're all making right, these errors in our investments, where we're investing at the wrong place in the uh, production structure based on what is eventually going to make sense. Right? Now, the reason this happens, as Professor Garrison explained, is that when we have credit expansion, in, a, in effect, our interest rates are lying to us. Right? Right? So as investors trying to decide what I want to invest in, now interest rates are very low. It makes sense for me to undertake very long structures of production. Now, normally, this would be the case if savings are high. Savings are high, interest rates fall. Right? With the credit expansion, though, savings aren't actually high. In fact, they're less than before, exactly as Professor Garrison described. So people are trying to consume more at the same time as we're trying to invest more. And this creates an issue. Right. So one way that we can think of this, uh, I really like Mises's parable here uh, regarding the home builder. Right? So he kind of imagines. Right, so suppose you have a home builder building this housing development, right? And there's a certain stock of resources available. And right? there's somebody in charge of keeping track of, say, how many bricks we have. Right? right? So the home builder goes to the person in charge of the brick inventory and says, well, how many bricks do we have? And he gets some number right from them. I say, okay, well, in that case, I know that I can build, say, 10 houses right, in this development. And start building these 10 houses. Uh, then it's discovered that right, as they have built, say, the first story of each of these houses, they're planning to be at least two stories tall, they find out they actually don't have as many bricks as they thought. <laughs> this is going to be an issue, right? Because physically, we don't have the resources to finish what we were planning, right? We are trying to do more than our sustainable level of resources would allow, right? So in that case, what do we have to do? We're going to have to change our plans, right? We found this error. We're going to have to change our plans. So some of these houses are not going to be able to be completed, right? Some of them we might decide it's actually best just to scrap and try to save whatever bricks we can to move them towards some of the other houses to make sure those are two stories. Maybe some of these are only going to be one story now, right? Either way, we see this error, and it results in us adjusting our plans. Right? Now, and as far as we try to move, say, some of the bricks from the houses that are already halfway built to the others, we can expect there will be loss, right? And it's very difficult to disassemble a brick house and not lose anything in the process. Right? I've not tried to do it myself, but I'm going to trust right, this is the case. Right? Whenever I've seen buildings torn down, we tend not to end up with very nice, neat, orderly piles of bricks. Right? It's, it's very broken up, very hard to use in the future. Right? This is kind of capturing the fact that we can't just easily move right, capital from one stage to another. Right? Once we've started using it for something, it becomes somewhat specific toward that particular use. And that makes it very difficult right, to move towards something else. This is going to be a very important part of our story. Okay, so this is where error comes in. We're 
investing in the wrong things, the things we're investing in though are somewhat specific, which means when these errors are revealed and we have to adjust, we're going to lose something in the process. Right, so, how are we going to explain these errors happening in light of the fact that generally entrepreneurs are pretty good at what they do? Right. So now we could just say that you know, foresight is hard. Right? In particular, foresight for business cycles is hard. Right? Seems like macroeconomists who you'd think it's, it's a hard job to predict business cycles don't always do it very well. Right? Well, if this is the case, right, it might be that somebody that say is a home builder, they may be very good at predicting say, on average, what the demand for houses will be, but that doesn't mean they can predict the overall state of the economy. Right? These are two different, connected, but different things. Right? So maybe foresight is specific into a particular area, whereas macroeconomic foresight is very different. It's not actually the same skill. Right? So this is possible. So uh, that's one possibility. Another out there uh, is that uh, Walter Block suggests that we could think of the low interest rates as in effect being bribes, right? right? So I may know that eventually right, this isn't going to work out, right? But at the same time, even if I know Austrian business cycle theory, I know that the boom does not immediately end, right? Okay, I might be convinced, right, to go along with this for a little while, right? Because in effect, by giving me a low interest rate, you're bribing me to participate in the boom. Okay? Even if I know it's going to end, I can hang on for a bit, right? So it's maybe be a possibility. Right? Uh, another view out there, uh, which I criticized, is a uh, Carillion Dempster. Right? They suggested that there's this conflict between private and social incentives. Right? That is, that in this low interest rate environment, even if I know for sure that there is this uh, boom that is going to end up collapsing, right? I might go ahead and participate anyway, despite the fact that that makes the boom happen. Uh, the, the reason that I criticize them, those who have heard my talk on game theory, if not, sure it's on YouTube, right? Go, go look it up, right? Is that if we all collectively know we can do better, right? If we plan together and make different choices, it seems like there's an incentive there to plan together and make different choices, right? So it's not immediately obvious to me why we wouldn't do that, right? So what I suggest, and actually this was not at all original to me, this particular idea, uh, it's original as far as I can tell to Baxendale and Evans, right? That is that what monetary expansion does is it, it changes the quality of entrepreneurs right? by changing who is an entrepreneur. Right? So we could imagine all of our entrepreneurs, say, lining up in a line, right? so we have our best entrepreneurs on one side, our worst at the end, right? and say they're, they're getting bank loans. Right? Right? So they come to the bank, we review their application, right? oh yes, this is a very good plan, it looks like it's going to succeed, right? we give this particular entrepreneur a loan. Right? Next entrepreneur comes in and so on until we've run out of money and okay, everybody at the end of the line doesn't get any money. Right? So the worst entrepreneurs are ruled out by the financial system making reasonably good choices about who to fund. Right? Now what happens though when we have this credit expansion? Right? Well, two things. Right? First, I now have more money to hand out in loans. Right? So I can fund the somewhat lower quality but still probably has a good chance, we hope, right, types of um, projects. But another thing happens. Right? That is, those people that were at the front of the line say, mm, I know how this works. I know this investment very well may not pay off. At some point, things are going to collapse. So I'm not going to stay in the line. Right? So they just abandon the line. Right? So of this line of people, we've lost the people at the front right, that have decided they would rather wait for the crash right, and pick things up there. Right? And we've picked up people from the end. So we've had, we have this very systematic decline in the quality of the entrepreneur. Right, so even if we believe that, say, foresight is foresight, right, it's not just about foresight in your field, but foresight macroeconomically, right, we still end up with errors here, right? precisely because good foresight is actually keeping some people out, but not everybody has the same level of foresight. Uh, if you want proof that there are people with bad foresight, you can look at me. Right? I have, um, I've been investing in the stock market for a very long time. I first got started, I think it was like seventh grade. At the, plan, at the time, I was planning to go to law school and be a lawyer, right? Bad foresight, right? Okay, I can't even predict my own actions in the future. This is it's not good, right? right? So I was planning to go to law school, so I was investing in the stock market to pay for law school eventually. Right? And I did very, very well at first. Uh, the first stock that I bought was AirTouch Communications, which nobody here remembers because you were probably born after it got bought out by Vodafone, 
which our European friends may know. Right? Uh, here in America, we, we know Vodafone not as Vodafone, but they're in partnership with Verizon. Right? Yeah, okay. Yeah, this stock did very well. Uh, I sold it, I think, I think it had roughly doubled. I think it was roughly a year. Right? So there's eighth grade me. I have good foresight. Right? Move over, Warren Buffett. Right. But it turns out what was actually happening was that it was just the you know, mid to late 90s, right? And if you bought stock in a cell phone company, odds were pretty good it was going to get bought out by somebody and the stock was going to double. Maybe a year I got a little bit lucky, but stock was going to double sometime within a couple years, right? right? So what happened then? Well, I went to college, right? You know, young Warren Buffett, majoring in economics. Right? I, I decided to open an Ameritrade account. This, this is great because now I can trade very cheaply. Right. This means I can use that wonderful foresight I have really, really fast. Right. And I can, buy, I can buy these stocks and, and watch them go bankrupt one after another. It seemed like for a while that was the best predictor a stock would go bankrupt. Is I would buy it. <laughs> and I have literally $1.19 in that account now. I put in much more than that. Right. But I keep the account right, so that I remind myself... <laughs> how good my foresight is, right? So we have some people that, are bad, that have bad foresight, but they, they get sucked into this, right? And my biography is, is a case of that, okay? All right, so we can see have, we have some idea then, okay, on average, our entrepreneurs are pretty good at what they do, right? right? Most of the time, they have pretty good foresight, maybe even pretty good at, at macroeconomic foresight. But when we start having that credit expansion, we lose the good entrepreneurs, we bring in worse entrepreneurs, and we start making these errors, right? As soon as we recognize that people are not all the same when it comes to foresight, suddenly we get this rational expectations claim, right, should fall to the wayside, right? We don't even need to say that nobody's rational. We don't even need to say the normal, ra the normal entrepreneurs aren't rational. Right? As long as there's a group out there that isn't, that might possibly take their place, that's good enough. Okay. All right, so let, let's move then into thinking about, right, what kind of conclusions does this create for us when we start thinking about government stimulus? Okay, so let's talk about what government stimulus is. Right here, I'm not thinking about, say, Janet Yellen when we have you know, things collapsing. Right? Uh, I'm not talking about her deciding to print more money. We've already talked about business cycles. We know what the eventual consequence of that would be. Rather, I'm thinking about what seems to always happen. Right? And this, this happened to me. I was in graduate school at the time that the housing market collapsed. Here, let me fix it here. There we go. Right, so I was in graduate school at the time that the housing market turned and started falling. Uh, my wife was working at um, the library at the time, and you know we went out with some of her coworkers and their family, and I got into this discussion with one of her um, coworkers' wives, right? And you know things are really bad, and she turned and she said, "Oh, you study economics? What should we do?" And I said, "Nothing." Right? And she said, "But we have to do something." Right? Now this is one of those cases where. Uh, I've gotten somewhat interested in classical education, right? and uh, there's this very useful term, um, a distinguo. Right? I don't, I'm pronouncing it very wrong because my Latin is horrific. Right? But, but it basically means let's define our terms. Right? What exactly do we mean there? We have to do something. Okay. Who is we? Right? I suspect we did not specifically include my, oh, this, this is a really roundabout way to say somebody, my wife's coworker's wife. <laughs> I suspect she did not actually include herself as someone that needs to actively do something right, about the uh, recession. I don't think she was planning, for example, to go out and start a business and hire up all these unemployed people. I, I, I don't think that was what she had in mind. Right? We probably did not include her personally. Right? It seems, though, anytime people say this, we have to do something, right, they often mean the government in this kind of situation. Right? So it's not we have to do something. Right? We the people, right, acting through Congress, which really just means Congress, right, right has to pass a law, right, right, that is going to do something, right. Well, what is something, right? Well, something generally means has to spend a lot of money, right, to hire up all these people that just lost their jobs, right. Okay, right, so, so that, that's really what we mean. We have to do something, not we, that's what they mean, right. We have to do something. Congress has to pass a law, the government has to sign, and it's going to hire up a bunch of these people or lead to them being hired right, right, in order to create jobs, right, to hire these unemployed people. Okay, so that's what we have in mind by government stimulus, or what we'd call fiscal stimulus, stimulus through spending. Right. So what would we want this stimulus to look like, right, given what we know about the way Austrian capital theory works? Right? Okay, well, 
it would be really nice right, if we could immediately start producing stuff that people would like to buy. Which means it would be really nice if we had a bunch of capital sitting around that wasn't being used, right? And then all we have to do, right, is hire some people, right? Have them, right, start working, and we're going to produce stuff, right? I know kind of the story you often hear, uh, um, say, related in some way to the Keynesian cycle theory, right? as well, why is it that we have all these unemployed people without shoes in this empty shoe factory, right? That's kind of the image we have in mind, right? The, uh, the solution is obvious, right? Let's open this shoe factory's doors, have them hire those people, then the people have an income and they can buy shoes. <gasps> this is wonderful, right? And it ends up, we have good news as Austrians, right, for our government. Since we believe that the cycle right, was caused by these misallocations of capital and once these errors are revealed, we have to abandon some of this capital. <gasps> we have some empty shoe factories. This sounds nice, right? Right, we're actually ready right, for some stimulus to happen, except these aren't actually shoe factories. Right? Okay, so I think the, the much better um, analogy is something like lead baseball factories. Right? Right? Lead baseball, that, that example is not original to me. I'm pretty sure I took that idea from Walter Block. Because, you know, what, what use is a lead baseball? Right? Not, not very much, right? So I suspect there's a very low demand for these goods. But, but let's imagine that, for example, the government decided right, that we needed to, to produce right, lead baseballs. Right? So they, say, start some kind of stimulus program for producing lead baseballs, right? So we start subsidizing the production of lead baseballs. The government buys these things up. Okay? Well, we can imagine then that even though it's not socially useful whatsoever, there are going to be entrepreneurs that say, well, <laughs> there's money to be made, right? The government will hand it to me. I'm going to start producing lead baseballs. I don't care if they sit in a government warehouse somewhere forever. I, I can spend this money as well as anything else. Right? So we start producing lead baseballs. I would suggest that all, of the, all that misallocated capital that we had during the boom is basically the equivalent of these lead baseball factories. Right? Now, some of it we might be able to reallocate to something else. Okay. Well, we'll grant that, right? but some of it is going to be very specific. And if we want to bring that capital back into production, we're going to have to have people produce those things right, that we're planning to be produced. Right? Now, you actually hear, uh, although maybe you didn't hear, you may not have been paying attention at the time, it's 10 years ago at this point. Right? Right? When we hit, up here we have, this is the um, housing prices. So we can see very clearly where the housing boom happened and collapsed. Right? right around the time that the housing boom was collapsing and the economy was falling apart. Right? Okay, we have to do something. Right? All right, so what should we do? Well, we really want to fund shovel-ready projects. Right? That was the phrase, right? Okay. It, was all, uh, it was also around this time, shortly thereafter, uh, that one of my favorite phrases from President Obama I got spoken, right? We need to repair our crumbling roads and bridges, right? Which, as someone who has visited countries that are not as wealthy as the U.S., calling our roads and bridges crumbling, I've been on much worse, okay? But anyway, it might be that I just live in a nice area of the U.S., I don't know, okay? All right, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to look for shovel-ready projects, right? That is where we've already made some investments, right, in the planning, Right? So really all we need is the funding for these projects. It just so happens that a lot of state governments have just sitting around waiting for funding, things like infrastructure projects we want to do. We want to build roads and bridges because if we don't, who else will? Right? So that's what we have ready to go. Right? We've done the, actually the earliest stages of production here would be the planning. Right? Okay. So we've done those early stages of production. These plans are just sitting there. Right? They're shovel ready. All we have to do is put the shovels in people's hands and we can start doing the excavation, start doing the construction, and we're good to go. Okay. All right, so what do we do? We fund shovel ready projects. Right? This makes perfect sense. Right? We're using the capital that has already been accumulated. Right? But what does this end up doing economically? Well, it creates lots of jobs, right? Oh, this is wonderful, right? In fact, it was estimated that uh, these uh, stimulus programs at the time were going to create something like 4 million jobs. Wow, 4 million jobs. Now, I, I'm, because I'm a human being, uh, Ilian words start to get confusing, right? When you talk to an average person, they don't actually understand the difference between a trillion and a million, right? But because I'm an economist, I am actually used to these differences. Right. So 4 million, I start comparing. Like, hey, 4 million people, I come from Ohio, we have a population of about 10 million. Wow, right. 
4 million people is basically the entire workforce of Ohio right, that is supposed to be able to be employed thanks to the stimulus. That's a lot of people. This feels like a pretty good program. If, if we really have these people that need work, sounds good. Right? Of course, then you start looking at the cost. <laughs> well, it's 800 billion. Well, this doesn't sound that bad, right? 800 billion divided by 4 billion? That's like 200 a piece. 200,000 a piece. <laughs> okay, now suddenly it feels a little bit different, right? I have my doubts right, that these 4 million people are making $200,000 each in these jobs. If they were, I'm in the wrong field. <laughs> okay, right? right? So, okay. So the first reality we have to recognize, right, is that the stimulus program or this money that's going to create jobs is not actually all going to the people it's supposed to help, right? There's, there's other things that have to be done because we recognize that if, if really all we did was take this $800 billion and divide it by 4 million and hand $200,000 checks right, to these 4 million people who are previously unemployed, we're not going to produce anything, right? I'm, okay, we could actually have a very similar program in terms of creating jobs and also expense if we paid them $200,000 a year to sit at home and watch YouTube cat videos. This, this would have exactly right, the same cost, exactly the same effect on um, unemployment, and actually perhaps be more reliable in the effect on unemployment. Right? Right? But we, we kind of recognize this is going to be wasteful, because right? even politicians recognize that some things are obviously wasteful. Right? So as much as Keynes may have recommended that we should bury, uh, you know, what is it, like pots of money or jars of money and have people go and dig them up as a stimulus program, he didn't really mean that. Right? He did suggest though, that it would work as a stimulus program. But we all recognize this, this doesn't feel like a good use of resources. Right? Right, so we want to go back, right, what are those plans we have for something that looks productive? Right? So let's build the roads and bridges. Right? Then we get some real thing out of it. Of course, when we do this, then that means we're having to divert resources, right? and not just the labor, but also other resources toward building these roads and bridges. Now these resources likely have other uses, as certainly these workers would potentially have other uses. So what are we doing then with the stimulus program? Right? We're simply taking these projects right, that have been proven right, to be erroneous. Right? That's, that's why we had the capital started and didn't finish it. Right? It was something we abandoned. Right? So we have something that was proven to be erroneous, and we want to make sure that gets finished. Right? Now, this may feel productive, but I, but I doubt that it's actually productive. I, I'm going to tell a story here, which before I got tenure, I would not have told. But one of my favorite uh, examples of waste, on my campus, we have a windmill. Now, windmills are not inherently unproductive. But when they were thinking about doing this, uh, the dean of our campus, right, had, had our campus evaluated right, for various types of green energy that we could potentially produce, right? So maybe we should you know, put up some solar panels or something like that. Uh, anybody who is familiar with the climate in Northeast Ohio suggests you know, solar panels may not be the best idea. I mean, we don't have enough sun for that to really be productive probably. Or, or maybe right, we are well suited for things like windmills. Right? So we're evaluating and this is a reasonable thing to do, right? Right, so he had it evaluated and he announced at a faculty meeting at the beginning of the school year, he said, we did this evaluation, we found out we are not a good location for a windmill. Okay, right. But solar panels might actually be okay. There are actually ways to do this that it might be all right if we say use them, say to shade cars in the parking lot, then we get the benefit of the shade and also produce some electricity. Okay, and if, it doesn't sound horrible. Right. So if you, if you want to do this, that's fine. I'll happily park under one of these solar panels. Right? That, that doesn't bother me. Right? But no, we think we're going to build a windmill. All right. In order to show that we are devoted right, to sustainability. Okay, now, now isn't, isn't sustainability about using resources in a wise fashion? to make sure we get value out of them, that we're not just wasting resources, right? You tell me I should recycle so that paper doesn't end up, right, in a dump somewhere, right? It comes back into use, right? right? So what, what we're really doing here is building a dump on campus with a functioning windmill on it that's not producing much electricity, right? I, actually, our, one of our secretaries 
uh, apparently somehow got hold of the data for how much electricity we've produced. And I believe in the first year after the windmill was built, it produced something like $5 worth of electricity. Right? This windmill cost, I believe, at least $50,000 to put up. Right? Fortunately, the math there isn't hard to do. It's a 0.01% rate of return, right? which admittedly is what I'm getting on my savings account at the moment. But, but this is not a great rate of return for an investment. If we have the $50,000, maybe we should do something else with it. Right? There might be better investments. I, I will take part of it. I'm happy to do that if we're going to waste this money. Right? It turns out, though, we had a grant, so it didn't matter. We can waste it. That's fine. Okay. All right. So th this would be one of those kinds of examples where we're just taking resources that could clearly be used somewhere else. So there are places where it does make sense to build windmills. Instead, we're using them here all right, on our campus where it doesn't actually make sense. Right? Similarly, when we make these kind of stimulus payments to try to get these um, industries going again, we want to make sure those lead baseball factories don't shut down so we can actually get lead baseballs out of the end. Right? We're diverting resources away from things that could actually be produced productively. Right? We have workers that now aren't having jobs producing things people actually want. Right? We have other forms of capital that could actually move out of these lead baseball factories into productive lines. Might be costly. We're going to lose something in the process. Right? But we don't lose everything by producing something nobody wants. Right? Okay. Right, so that's the idea uh, behind, this, behind the effect of government stimulus. We are taking away right, from these productive lines, moving it into unproductive lines. Right? And in fact, the because we know Austrian capital theory, it's going to be most tempting to put these investments, right, the stimulus investment, in those lines that we are most sure are unproductive. Right? This feels like a problem. Right. right, so then, what we've just proven right, is that if we're going to have effective stimulus, right, that is going to produce something, right, we're going to put it in those lines that are least productive in terms of value. 